Hello and welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of Shanks and Unilever PLC, and the citation for this case is 2019 UKSC 45. And this case looks at intellectual property law, which I always find completely fascinating, because it is interesting to see what people invent and the disputes that arise from the resulting patents. In these proceedings, the inventor in question is Professor Ian Shanks OBE, who has done a lot of work in the past with LCDs, but is perhaps most famous for his work on the technology behind digital blood glucose meters, which is at the heart of this case. For those of you who might not be aware, these meters play an enormous role in the treatment of diabetes. Someone who has diabetes wants to keep their blood glucose level as close to normal as possible, but if that needs to be measured several times a day, it is just not practical to have to go back and forth from a hospital or doctor's surgery. The digital blood glucose meter solves this problem by allowing a user to take their own small blood sample from the end of a finger, and then to use a small handheld device to measure the blood glucose level accurately, wherever they might be. Professor Shanks came up with something called the electrochemical capillary fill device, which works inside the meter to pull the blood up between two glass plates where the concentration level is measured. Anyway, the actual invention is not really that important, but it hopefully adds some colour to this case. The important thing is that Shanks worked for the respondents in this case, Unilever PLC, between 1982 and 1986, when he came up with this invention. To be slightly more accurate, he technically worked for Unilever UK Central Resources Limited, which we'll refer to throughout as CRL, which was not actually a trading company, but instead a subsidiary of the wider Unilever company. Under the law of the Patents Act 1977, the rights to the invention belonged to CRL rather than Shanks, and so CRL were then able to assign the rights to Unilever for a nominal £100. A number of patents then derived from the invention, and over time Unilever used this to derive a profit of somewhere in the range of £24.3 million. That is of course not the end of things, and more than a decade ago Professor Shanks began the current proceedings for compensation in line with Section 40 of the Patents Act 1977 which basically allows an employee to claim compensation where a company has derived a large profit from their invention. Unfortunately, when the case made its way before a hearing officer acting on behalf of the Comptroller General of Patents, it was found that in comparison to the overall size of Unilever as a company and the profits it would make, the actual benefit of £24.3 million was not, quote, outstanding, as required by Section 40, subsection 1b of the Act. An appeal in the High Court was rejected before Shanks was partially successful in the Court of Appeal, but it was still held that he would not be entitled to compensation. It is with that background that a final appeal was made to the Supreme Court, which is where we pick the case up. The justices, led by Lord Kitchen, began by offering a useful review of section 40 of the Patents Act, which first requires that an employee has made an invention which belongs to the employer and for which a patent or patents have been granted. The second question is, as hinted at earlier, whether there has been an outstanding benefit to the employer given the size and nature of their company. The final requirement is that the controller has to come to the conclusion that it is just for the employee to be awarded compensation. Within these provisions, there are two key terms which stand out and deserve to be defined. The first of these is the employer, as in this case it could be taken to mean either CRL or alternatively the umbrella corporation of Unilever. The intention of Parliament was for this to be given its ordinary meaning in the context of the case. And so in this situation where Shanks is employed by CRL, it is CRL who are the employer rather than Unilever as a whole. The second term that demands greater scrutiny is the, quote, benefit that is described in section 40. This could potentially cause problems for Professor Shanks because, if you remember, his employer CRL had only assigned the rights of his invention to Unilever for a nominal £100. However, the Supreme Court got around this by noting that the benefit not only includes the actual benefit received by the employer, 
but can also be defined as the benefit that the employer might reasonably be expected to derive from the patent, or, as is relevant in this case, the benefit of the assignation of the rights to the invention to another person. This means that as well as considering the £100 that CRL got for the invention, the court is also able to take into account the £24.3 million that Unilever received as a total benefit from use of the invention. Taking all of this into account, we can move on to the actual test in the statute, but this only serves to provide some more questions for us around definitions. For a start, one of the things that I already mentioned earlier on is that the invention is to be of, quote, outstanding benefit to the employer, end quote. Now, there is one way of reading this which gives the word outstanding its plain meaning such that the court looks at how brilliant or amazing the invention is. The problem is that this is pretty subjective, and secondly, the word outstanding is next to the word benefit, which, as we've already discussed, is related to the monetary value of the invention instead. That's all well and good, but it still leaves open the question about what an outstanding benefit is, and this is context-specific depending on how large the company is. For a small startup, £24.3 million is huge, but for a massive global corporation, it would barely be a drop in the ocean. So what about in this case? Well, again, it is something that is not exactly straightforward, because on the one hand, the individual research company, CRL, that employed Shanks was very small on its own, but it is part of a multinational company in the form of Unilever. For the justices, the important thing was to essentially pierce the corporate veil in this context, and so look at the commercial reality of the situation. The research group was not operating for its own sake, but so that any research or inventions could be used by any part of the wider company. With that in mind, it is fair to say that any benefit that might be accrued ought to be outstanding in the context of the wider company as well. This conclusion does not especially help Professor Shanks, but the court did note that profit margins are not the sole context for a decision of outstanding benefit, as a larger company might also be better positioned to exploit a successful invention, and useful comparisons can be drawn with other patents that emerged from the CRL company. It is on this point where the Supreme Court really distinguished itself from the original decision made by the hearing officer for the Comptroller General of Patents. While that officer focused heavily on the significant profit margins that Unilever enjoys, the justices noted that not only did this not really have much impact whatsoever on the eventual success of the invention, but it also ignores the wider context at play in this case. When this is in fact accounted for, the invention by Professor Shanks can be said to be of sufficiently outstanding benefit to fall within the meaning of section 40. The only question then is how much he should be entitled to. The hearing officer originally said that if they had allowed the case then 5% would be a fair share of the £24.3 million, and Lord Kitchen was keen to point out that it would not be appropriate to depart from that initial finding based on the facts of the case. However, the Supreme Court did add that due consideration should also be given to other financial factors, such as the tax that Shanks would have to pay, the impact of inflation, and the expenses that Unilever has incurred in the intervening period. Overall, I think that the decision in this case expands the statutory definition of when compensation is awarded under Section 40 of the Patents Act 1977. It is not that this is an especially limited definition to begin with, so we do sort of need to ask why they felt the need to do this here. I think that the reason is because of that phrase outstanding benefit, which sits a little bit uneasily with the rest of the provision. A person would be hard pressed to argue that where an employee has an invention that only makes a little, if any money, then there is a compelling reason that they should be compensated above and beyond what they already have actually been employed to do in the first place. The problem is that this is what Unilever tried arguing here when the invention made millions of pounds. The only reason that they were able to put this argument forward in any convincing manner is because of the overall size of the company. For those who maybe don't know Unilever, they are responsible for a wide range of household brands that includes Lynx, Shaw, Purcell and Hellman's to name just a few, 
Now clearly this is not relevant to the invention that Shanks came up with, and yet it is a factor that is taken into account when making a decision about his right to compensation. If we had instead been talking about a small company whose turnover was maybe a few million pounds a year, then this wouldn't even be a consideration. And yet because Unilever also happened to flog ice cream, it becomes part of the balancing act for the courts. I think that it is this injustice that the Supreme Court is trying to rectify here, but this is undoubtedly an extreme example where the statutory language has had to be pushed to its very limits. In reality, the legislation is just not fit for purpose, and there has to be a better way of accounting for the relative financial advantage that the invention brings to an undertaking. It's hard to say what form this ought to take because alternatives such as a fixed value amount do have problems of their own, and it's unlikely there will ever be a perfect solution that is applicable in all cases. The best thing might be for the legislation to remain relatively broad by using a phrase like reasonable benefit instead, and that way the courts will be given the leeway to take an approach that can adapt to different circumstances as they build up a body of case law. At the moment, the Supreme Court is doing this anyway in all but name, but this approach to the law where the language is pushed so far that it barely retains any of its original meaning is just not sustainable in the long run and sets a dangerous precedent for the role of judges. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this episode of the UK Law Weekly Podcast and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. Remember, you can check out my YouTube channel as well at youtube.com forward slash Marcus Cleaver, and also visit my website uklawweekly.com if you're interested in finding out more about past episodes. I hope you will have me in your ears again next week for another case, but for now, bye!